So without further delay, I have the pleasure to co-chair this session with uh, Professor Rajab Abdel Salam, Professor Hada Khazamil. And for the sake of time, uh, I have the pleasure to introduce my dear friend, the Professor Yasser Sadiq, uh, the Professor of Cardiology at uh, uh, Helwan University, and he's one of the experts in uh, the field of intervention, CTO, TAVI, and he's currently the, the secretary of the uh, Egyptian Society of Cardiology. Uh, Thank you. Professor Yasser is going to talk about tricuspid and aortic valve interventions in heart failure. To Yasser. Thank you, uh, Dr. Magdi. Uh, thank you so much for this excellent meeting. Uh, uh, actually, I uh, will uh, tackle a very hot topic about tricuspid and aortic valve interventions in heart failure. So uh, long subject, but uh, I will emphasize on some important point for uh, these diseases. As you all know that not all aortic stenosis are not created equal. We have types of aortic stenosis, normal flow, uh, high gradient, and normal flow and the gradient with low ejection fraction, and the classic low flow, low gradient aortic stenosis. In 2019, uh, in TCT, Martin Leon presented this uh, slide, and he told us uh, a very, uh, 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 exciting story about the first case by Alan Kirby in 2002. He called Martin Leon to ask him, to ask everyone what to do for a patient, 57 years old, has ejection fraction 10%, and he has a lot of comorbidities, blood pressure 60 on vasopressors, he has intra-LV uh, thrombus, and Martin Leon as, uh, uh, answered Kirby uh, that nothing to be lost. So go ahead and maybe this is the light for this therapy. After that, after Bartner, uh, Bartner 1 trial, uh, as you all know that it's uh, uh, a trial tackled patient in very high risk uh, category. And uh, it's a comparison between TAVR and surgical aortic valve replacement. And this is cohort from this uh, uh, study uh, with severe uh, aortic stenosis and, severe and LV dysfunction. And this is like 750 patients with LV dysfunction, ejection fraction less than 50%, treated with uh, transcaster aortic valve replacement or surgical aortic valve replacement. Actually, the result is LV ejection fraction improved, but it's failed to improve at 30 day, miss and mortality. And what is the impact of ejection fraction and aortic valve gradient in another trial called STS uh, TVT registry? Uh, this trial included like 11,000 patients and the baseline lower ejection fraction and the lower gradient were both associated with higher one-year mortality and hospitalization. And from Burton trial, all needs an answer for a patient with heart failure and aortic stenosis. What is the best treatment for those patients? And why it's a big problem? Because the heart failure per se, is a leading cause of hospitalization and death. Why? Because it increases after load by sympathetic activity and more impairment of LV systolic function and diastolic function. Although, as Professor Magdi mentioned, although all treatment, and uh, you can prescribe four pillars and uh, resguard, and there is no improvement for some category of patients. And the aortic stenosis, again, when it combined with uh, ejection for, uh, with heart failure, it increase after load and inc increase the uh, aortic load and, in, uh, and lead to increasing uh, in uh, uh, valvular load and arterial load and alter the hemodynamics in aortic st stenosis. And the why is this patients not benefit from medical treatment? Because fixed blood pressure uh, and all of these patients 
uh, don't respond to uh, bron vasodilators and medical treatment, and no medical option to reduce arterial load in uh, this category. Till in 2019, Tiver and Load trial design. This is trial for patient with with heart failure and moderate aortic stenosis, ejection fraction less than 50%, and they uh, randomized the patient for uh, transcaster aortic valve replacement by Sabian valve, balloon expandable valve, and only medical treatment without intervention, and they follow up the patients. And there is a lot of inclusion criteria include all symptoms and signs of heart failure with moderate aortic stenosis, but uh, uh, they include a patient with ejection fraction more than 20. And the comes to end point that all cause deaths, cardiovascular deaths, non-cardiovascular deaths, and uh, heart failure hospitalization. And this is the conclusion of unload trial that aortic stenosis and the heart failure increase with age, heart failure patient face impaired quality of life and premature death, heart failure therapy primary aims for after load reduction and in heart failure and the moderate aortic stenosis, TAVI may provide additional after load reduction to improve quality of life and the outcome. And there may be some advantage for TAVR in this population with severe aortic stenosis and heart failure. And after that, this is in pipeline, this is a progressed trial, another trial, another randomization, one-to-one -one with TAVR patient for uh, patient with heart failure and uh, moderate aortic stenosis versus medical treatment and the primary endpoint all cause mortality, stroke, and unplanned cardiovascular hospitalization at two years, and they will follow patient mm -hmm. up to 10 years. And this is one of our patients. This is male patient in severe heart failure. He has all symptoms of heart failure, and he admitted with uh, uh, cardiogenic shock, and he was in vasopressor, and he has uh, 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 severe aortic stenosis by cosmic aortic valve, as you can see here, and he has, as you, as you can see here, the ejection fraction is 28% with a very bad uh, shape. And this patient, when uh, we tackling the, his aortic valve, he arrested during, uh, uh, during release of the self-expandable valve, and after releasing the valve, the heart came again, and you can see here, this is immediately post uh, taver and this patient improved after only three days. His LV function improved uh, and reached up to 45 degree. So how does TAVR differ from surgery? TAVR is less invasive. Cardiopulmonary bypass itself can be detrimental and larger effective orifice for uh, TAVR more than surgical is very promising and uh, I can go to tricuspid valve intervention. The prevalence of tricuspid regurg, regurgitation, it's not less than aortic. And you can see here in the right side that the prevalence uh, of aortic stenosis is 1.9, and in tricuspid is 2.6. And the newly diagnosed cases for tricuspid regurgitation 1.7, and for aortic stenosis only 0.7. And honestly, transcaster treatment of tricuspid regurg in guidelines still 2B. Why? Because the results not so promising. Why? Because the prognosis of tricuspid regurg is uh, uh, questionable till now, and this all all this is retrospective study from different studies, and you can see here on the left side, this is retrospective analysis of 5,000 patients and uh, did tricuspid uh, 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 surgery, and one year survival rate only in severe tricuspid regurg, 60, means that 40% died in first year. And also this is surgical outcomes of tricuspid, uh, uh, tricuspid valve surgery, and you can see here this is from uh, randomized from, uh, sorry, it's uh, uh, retrospective from 2,000 patients, and you can see here the mortality reached in, uh, in hospital mortality reached up to 15%. 
So the guidelines is clear for tricuspid valve repair. Tricuspid valve repair is indicated only if we have severe primary tricuspid, tricuspid regurgitation, patient is going for left-sided valve surgery and has severe tricuspid regurgitation, or mild and moderate tricuspid regurgitation, and tricuspid annulus dilatation with right heart failure. This is only the indication. Otherwise, conservative treatment is indicated. And why? Because as you can see here, this is half or one third of the devices now available in the market. And you can see here, all these devices differs from the technique. So if you, if you want to tackle uh, tricuspid, you have to know the mechanism of tricuspid regurgitation. As you can see, direct suture aneuploplasty, direct ring aneuploplasty, cohabitation enhancement, and valve replacement. And uh, this is a very promising trial for trivalve registry, and this is uh, for le leaflet therapies edge to edge, and this is the most commonly uh, used nowadays, and this is the mostly uh, uh, or widely used uh, device worldwide called the triclip for tricuspid regurgitation. And this is a case of tricuspid regurgitation. As you can see, here, severe tricuspid regurgitation and after clipping, it's very similar for mitral clipping, but by different shape to uh, accommodate the tricuspid uh, valve. And why there is anatom anatomical challenge in the tricuspid? Because, because there is some anatomic and physiological uh, difficulties because tricuspid annulus is larger, leaflet are thinner and more fragile, high cordial density and are uh, uh, right ventricular trabecular and the thinner and the more fragile leaflets make this procedure is very difficult. And uh, of course, lack of calcium makes the uh, problem of sealing with residual tricuspid regurgitation. The valve is located more anteriorly compared to mitral valve, so transitorial echocardiography is particularly shelling during the procedure, and the tricuspid annulus is a saddle-shaped elbicide, uh, and this is, makes uh, uh, the technique diff, differ for each, uh, uh, each device present in the market. So this uh, paper published in 2018 uh, by Azim Latib, uh, one of uh, most interested in the uh, treatment of tricuspid regurgitation, and uh, he, they showed that we have to uh, classify the pathology of tricuspid regurgitation, if primary or secondary, and if the primary, it's prolapse, rheumatic, lead-induced, and secondary, which phase, and for when we know exactly the cause and the pathology, we can use the appropriate uh, device for tricuspid regurgitation. So my conclusion is that functional tricuspid regurgitation is common and associated with a poor prognosis, especially in heart failure patients. Majority of patients are currently not being offered any interventions. Patient selection and the timing of interventions are paramount for all valvular intervention, especially tricuspid valve mechanism of tricuspid regurgitation important in device selection. I hope to use some of these uh, devices soon in Egypt. Thank you. Many thanks, uh, Professor Yasser. Uh, I think you have a flight now. Uh, okay. It is difficult to, uh, <laughs> to answer a question, if you no, have. No, no, it's OK. Uh, I have a question related to the aortic stenosis uh, in case of uh, low flow, low gradient uh, aortic valve. Uh, which is uh, better uh, outcome and better follow-up? The uh, gradient with impaired ejection fraction or low gradient, low uh, flow type of uh, aortic uh, management? Because I found difficulty, how can I manage that? Because I don't know the gradient across it before. Usually we, we measure the annulus and measure the valve and we couldn't uh, found a, a gradient. And we know that from the mitral uh, point of view, there is uh, contractile dysfunction, which may not uh, gain the function. How can you deal with this uh, from your experience? Um, I think, first of all, we have to prove that this is a true aortic stenosis. 
And if it is true aortic stenosis with severe aortic stenosis and uh, low ejection fraction, and uh, if you have a patient, for example, with severe aortic stenosis with mean gradient like 20, and this patient after the vitamin echo reached for severe aortic stenosis, this patient definitely will improve after uh, uh, turbor, after transcaster aortic valve replacement. And uh, you can expect that the ejection fraction will improve and the gradient will eliminate. So the mean 20 will go to 10 with improvement ejection fraction, it's vice versa. So this is how to, to uh, follow these patients. Any question from the floor? Okay, thank you, thank uh, you. Professor Yasser. <laughs> I have the honor to introduce the next speaker, uh, Professor uh, Hatim uh, Sulaiman. Uh, I think he is the pioneer in uh, echo, especially in uh, uh, critical care. Uh, and the, uh, his talk will be about the ultrasound in uh, cardiac uh, care. Uh, Professor Hatim. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. Uh, dear colleagues, good evening. It's a great pleasure to be here and congratulations to Professor Magdi Abdul Hamid for the great Congress and the fantastic organization. Very delighted to be with you here. And in this uh, presentation, I'm going to discuss a practical approach to uh, uh, perform lung ultrasound in our cardiac care. So historically, the lungs were deemed unsuitable for lung ultrasound because the lungs are normally fully aerated. And we all know from our echocardiography practice that air is the enemy of ultrasound. So this is one of the historical uh, 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 quotations from Dr. Harrison's Manual of Internal Medicine in the 1992. He mentioned that the lungs are not suitable for ultrasound. And interestingly, around the same time, exactly around the same year, this was challenged by Dr. Daniel Lichtenstein from France, who published his seminal work, which looked at the different artifacts generated by the lungs when you perform ultrasound. And by understanding the analysis of these artifacts, we are able to assess different patterns of aeration of the lungs, which includes normal aeration, reduced aeration due to congestion, for example, in heart failure, or total loss of aeration in the context of consolidation. And that will be the focus of my presentation. And if you put the word lung ultrasound on PubMed, you will notice the exponential increase in the number of publications over the years. You almost reached a record number of publications in 2021. And before finishing 2022, we're almost about to, to exceed that record number of publications. So the, the basics of performing lung ultrasound relies on uh, trying to analyze the different artifacts generated by ultrasound when we put the probe on the lungs. The normal parenchyma is not visible, so we don't normally see the lung tissue when we perform ultrasound of the lungs, but we see the artifact which reflects the degree of aeration, and our acoustic window for performing lung ultrasound is the intercostal space. And of course, the advantages of performing lung ultrasound are numerous. Ultrasound at the bedside is safe, it is repeatable, it is validated, and it is rapid. It reduces cost because it reduces the need for chest x-ray. It can also reduce the reliance on chest CT, although it does not replace CT, and CT remains the gold standard for thoracic imaging. And of course, it is safe because it reduces radiation exposure in the context of reducing number of, of x-rays. So how do we perform lung ultrasound? The first thing, we need to know which probe to use. We can equally use the cardiac phased array transducer to scan the parenchyma. And you can also use the curvilinear abdominal probe. And if you are looking at the pleura as the superficial part of the lung, you need to use the high frequency linear transducer. Uh, and in the context of heart failure, we mainly want to look at whether there is congestion or not, and that's a parenchymal assessment. And this is done by either the phased array cardiac transducer or the curvilinear transducer. And the next step is to knowing the systematic approach for performing lung ultrasound. And there is nothing absolutely uh, right or wrong in this context, because you can perform uh, uh, up to a comprehensive eight zones scanning on each lung if you have time with the patient. And actually, the more comprehensive the, the protocol, the better the accuracy of the protocol if you have time with your patient. But if you are working in an acute situation, in a critically ill patient, you can also use uh, down to three points protocol where you have two anterior zones 
um, and one posterior lateral zone. And here, this is an example of one of the simple and validated protocols, which divides each lung into six zones. You have two anterior, two lateral, and two posterior. You can perform it equally in the supine patient, as well as the upright patient in the outpatient clinic. And then knowing where to put the probe on the chest, uh, if we're talking about parenchymal assessment, you ideally use the probe horizontally or obliquely aligned with the intercostal space. If we are talking about pleural assessment, which is important in the context of pneumothorax, for example, you need to put the probe as in the upper image in the vertical position, and that's the linear probe with the indicator of the probe towards the patient head. And if you are looking for pleural effusion, for example, or consolidation, your aim is to Put the probe in the mid-axillary line, exactly as in the lower image here, with the indicator of the patient of the probe towards the patient head. And the, the aim is to find the diaphragm as your landmark. And I'm going to show you examples of the findings. So what's the normal? This is the first normal artifact that is seen on lung ultrasound. And it is described as A-lines. And this is actually described as bad sign. So what is the bad sign? When you put the probe vertically on the chest, you will expect to have the two rib shadows at both edges of the probe. On the right side, you will have one rib shadow. On the left side, another dark rib shadow. And in between, you will see this uh, horizontal bright pleural line. So that's the pleural line. And here you have reverberation artifacts of the pleural line. And those are called A-lines. The A stands for aeration. And it usually indicates normal aeration or dry lungs and no congestion. It can also be seen in pneumothorax, but the clear indicator to differentiate pneumothorax from no congestion is the presence of pleural sliding. If the pleura is sliding, as I will show you in the next uh, image, if you see the shimmering of the uh, two layers of the pleura, that would indicate absence of pneumothorax. And if the pleura is not sliding, that will be suspicious for pneumothorax. And here, this is a moving frame of a patient with A-lines, and we saw these A-lines bilaterally, so that is absolutely normal. If we scan all of us here in the room, all of us will have predominant A-lines, which will indicate no congestion. And if you start to see congestion, that will be indicated by the appearance of these vertical comet tails or laser-like beams, which indicates elevation of the extravascular lung water, uh, and it's very sensitive. It is far more sensitive than chest x-ray, far more sensitive than symptoms, and the development of hypoxia. Uh, and of course, to identify them that, but, uh, as pathological B-lines, they have to have criteria. They have to have, be longitudinal, starting from the pleural line, going, going all the way to the far field. They have to be well-defined. Mm -hmm. So you, if you find only one short B-line not reaching the, the far field, this is not considered a pathological B-line. And also, there should be at least three B-lines, isolated B-lines, in one intercostal space. If you find two B-lines or less, that is absolutely normal. And exactly as you can see here, this is a patient with congestion. You see plenty of B-lines, and all of them are clearly sliding with the pleural uh, sliding and moving with the pleural sliding, which is one of the other features. The, one of the useful things about the B-lines that they can give you an idea about the degree of congestion, because the more the number of B-lines, the more likely this patient is congested. So if you see the B-lines well separated, non-coalescent, that would indicate early degree of congestion interstitial edema. And if you see the B-lines coalescent, filling out the whole screen, the screen becomes bright white because of the extent of the B-lines. That would extend higher grade of lung edema and alveolar edema. And this is the pattern we see with our patients in frank pulmonary edema and hypoxia. And that's actually probably the most important slide in my presentation because it shows you the different shades of aeration in the lungs. Starting from normal aeration at the top, where you see horizontal lines, to reduction of aeration and appearance of these vertical lines, interstitial edema if they are non-coalescent, and alveolar edema if they are coalescent. And finally, when the fluid inside the lungs become fully replaced with tissue and solid material, that is what we call consolidation, which can be clinically identified as pneumonia or atelectasis. Consolidation itself is a pathological term. 
So a few words about evidence. There are many uh, studies now which validates the reliability of B-lines, especially in the context of heart failure, as a prognostic marker to evaluate pulmonary congestion in outpatients. This is a study which looked at almost 100 patients comparing lung ultrasound with previously validated clinical congestion parameters, the NT pro BMP, the E over E prime, the X-ray, and the six minutes walk test. And they, find, they found very good correlation between the B-lines with more established parameters of cardiac decompensation. And the cutoff of the number of B-lines found in this study was 15 B-lines that was considered as a quick and reliable assessment of decompensation in patients with heart failure. And that's another study which also looked at the appearance of B-lines as a way to risk stratify patients with heart failure coming to uh, the outpatient clinic in patients with chronic systolic heart failure. They are also important prognostic markers in heart failure patients, and this is a study which was published a few years ago in European Heart Journal, looking at almost 200 patients with class 2 to 4 NYHA heart failure um, coming to the outpatient clinic. And they found that patients with abnormal B-lines, which means three or more B-lines in one intercostal space, had fourfold higher risk of primary outcome compared with those with no increase in the number of B-lines, with normal number of B-lines. And another study, I mean, there are many studies. For the sake of time, I will jump that. But the very important thing to mention that now B-lines are integral part of the heart failure guidelines mentioned by the ASC. And this is an, an important contribution and advancement of point of care ultrasound in our day-to-day -day practice. And it's not only used in heart failure, it is also used in non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema to evaluate effectiveness of fluid removal in hemodialysis patients and in interstitial lung disease. We also used it very frequently in COVID-19 patients because it enabled us to reduce reduce the need for CT scans in the context of the pandemic, and we were able to correlate the ground glass opacification on CT with the appearance of the pattern of B-lines in patients with COVID-19. And of course, you can also use it to differentiate cardiac from non-cardiac pulmonary uh, pattern by the appearance of the B-lines, by the abnormalities seen on the pleura, and interestingly, you can also use it in your dobutamine stress study because the appearance of the B-lines is a very sensitive indicator of hemodynamic congestion, far superior to chest X-ray symptoms and development of hypoxia. You should integrate it with your echocardiogram because it's an easy study, easy to learn, it doesn't take time, and if you add it to your echocardiographic study, you will increase the diagnostic yield of your echocardiographic assessment of your cardiac patient. And of course, we should keep in mind the limitations because it might miss pathologies deep within the lungs. It requires some training, although it's not a long training. It's an evolving field with more evidence needed and always use it within the clinical context. So finally, that's my take home message. I think it should be integrated to our echocardiographic assessment of our cardiac patient and we need to look at it as an extension of our bedside clinical examination, as an add-on instead of our stethoscope. It has much higher sensitivity and specificity compared to chest X-ray. And again, I'm repeating the, the word of use it within the clinical context. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for your uh, excellent presentation. Uh, Questions uh, with respect to uh, practice, uh, clinical practice, uh, not uh, uh, papers, correct practice. Uh, is uh, some patient, uh, you detect congestion or uh, signs of heart failure in ultrasound and they're not present in the X-ray? Many times, yeah, many times. Yes, many times. Yes. Is the patient uh, present with signs and symptoms of heart failure? Yeah, yes. And, and actually, many patients, I discover the findings even without significant symptoms, which brings me into the sensitivity of the tool. Because I do it in every patient. I work in a cardiothoracic intensive care unit, and I almost scan every patient. So it enables me to detect subclinical manifestations. And I can identify congestion before the patient starts to become really symptomatic. So it provides me ability to be preemptive and act early before the patient deteriorates. Uh, what's about pulmonary embolism? 
again, pulmonary embolism is one of the things that lung ultrasound cannot diagnose. But if you add it to your echocardiographic assessment, it will increase the diagnostic yield by... Uh, simply X-ray can diagnose uh, pulmonary embolism, simply. X-ray? Yes. Uh, you mean pulmonary infarction? Yes. It can, but with lung ultrasound, you can add it to your, uh, your cardiac ultrasound, or your echo, and if you see RV strain in the absence of B lines, so if you see A lines, if you see wedge-shaped peripheral pleural consolidation with right ventricular strain, that is very likely to be pulmonary embolism, and that's one of the tools. The, the key is a multimodal approach. So yes. trying to add these tools together to increase ability to diagnose, but it cannot precisely tell me this is pulmonary embolism. Thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you. This is great. Actually, Thank it you. is great. Uh, we have a dilemma of uh, uh, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, and all of us know that the main complaint is shortness of breath. Could it help to scan the lung and to search for this congestion in case of uh, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, or you keep it for critically ill patient in the ICU? No, not at all. There are many data actually which shows, and we are currently finalizing the EACVI document on lung ultrasound and heart failure. And a half of the document is dedicated to heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And there are many data which shows the role of lung ultrasound in detecting congestion in these patients. Because it doesn't matter the cardiac systolic uh, presence or absence of systolic dysfunction. The key thing is to find congestion very early before symptoms and very early before X-ray. And I think this is one of the most powerful features of lung ultrasound. Detection of B-lines would be very early indicator of elevation of lung water, which is something we cannot precisely tell by clinical examination alone or X-ray alone. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Hadi, for you. your elegant presentation. You. And uh, now we move to uh, uh, hear about an important target in the management for failure with iron deficiency and iron deficiency and heart failure, a critical review by Dr. Hadi uh, Shukud. Good evening again. So, We'll, uh, we'll discuss today one of the comorbidities and heart failure that they limit the management and increase symptoms uh, and they should be treated. So quality of life is as important as survival and hospitalization. We always, in our, in our practice, we see patients with heart failure, ischemic or non-ischemic cardiomyopathies, one quadruple therapy, they are on heart failure uh, therapy on maximal doses, they have already implanted SCRDD, and they are still being admitted with acute decompensation or being uh, uh, fatigued, tired all the time. And they always, always we have to rule out other causes for, for this. It's not always heart failure uh, per se. So we have to rule out infection, maybe COPD. We have to rule out sleep apnea. And one important thing that we have to rule out is anemia is prevalent in heart failure patients, as well as iron deficiency and depression. Always we have to screen for all these when we look at patients with heart failure on optimal medical therapy and they are still symptomatic. We know that uh, anemia is prevalent in heart failure patients and uh, there was a, an old study that they studied the darbopoietin alpha versus placebo in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction in patients with anemia and heart failure. It was called the red HF trial. This trial uh, was neutral for the primary and secondary endpoints. The primary endpoints were death and heart failure hospitalization. But what was important is the adverse events were high in the darbopoietin alpha group thromboembolic adverse events were high. And this has uh, led to a class three indication, meaning that giving these patients darbopoietin alpha, they, it's harmful. And we should not uh, treat our anemic patients with darbopoietin alpha. So one important thing also, uh, the cause of anemia worldwide 
And since long, uh, if we compare 1990 to 2013, the cause of anemia still in green, as you see here, iron deficiency is the main cause of anemia. And on the right side of, the, of my slide, even with age, from uh, uh, the higher the age, we see less uh, iron deficiency as a cause, but still the most prevalent is iron deficiency. When it comes to heart failure patients, one in two patients with heart failure, they have iron deficiency. In acute heart failure, this increases even more. And the one important uh, lesson that we have to know is that iron deficiency can occur without anemia in 40% of the patients. So they should not be anemic, but they can have iron deficiency. And iron deficiency increased with the NEHA class of these patients. Uh, this is a study by Mullins and uh, his colleagues from Belgium. He showed that it, uh, with ejection fraction, whether heart failure will reduce preserved or mid-range ejection fraction, we have the iron deficiency is prevalent. Not only that, in the mid-range and half puff uh, range, even it's higher than in patients with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction. And iron deficiency, what is the impact of iron deficiency on our quality of life and on survival and hospitalization? First, iron deficiency uh, uh, reduces exercise capacity, as has been shown on the, on the left side of the curve here. As you can see, iron deficiency without anemia, uh, they have worse uh, VO2 max compared just to anemic patients with, uh, without iron deficiency. Uh, and... Uh, not only that, but it's also this uh, reduction in exercise capacity. It's not only in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, but also in mid-range, as well as preserved ejection fraction. Iron deficiency affects survival. So in this study, if we compare uh, of 1,500 patients, uh, patients without iron deficiency versus patients with iron deficiency, we can see that patients with iron deficiency have a poor outcome. Also, uh, patients with iron deficiency with or without anemia, they have uh, an increase in all-cause mortality and heart failure hospitalization. And even patients with iron deficiency uh, with no anemia, they do worse than only anemic patients. At the in vitro level, what happens to the myocytes with iron deficiency? Uh, as you can see here in red, these, uh, this is a myocyte which was depleted from iron. We see that we have decreased iron, uh, uh, we, ha we have decreased contractility. When we replenish iron in this myocyte in the blue line, it returned to its normal. So there is a decrease in uh, uh, myocyte contractility with iron deficiency when the myocytes are iron deficient. This is an in vivo trial in humans using uh, cardiac phosphorus uh, magnetic resonance spectroscopy, they measured the phosphorus creatinine over ATP ratio, which is a marker of cellular energetic status. And you can see that it's reduced in patients who have iron uh, deficiency. Uh, and uh, even patients with anemia alone without iron deficiency, they don't have reduction in uh, phosphocreatinine over ATP ratio. So this is also a marker of decreased energetics in patients with, uh, at the myocyte level. This is a myocyte, cardiomyocyte of a normal uh, myocyte without iron deficiency. And the other, uh, uh, the other uh, um, uh, myocyte with iron deficiency. And you can see that there is decreased contractility in, patient, in myocytes with iron deficiency. What is the causes of iron deficiency in heart failure patients? What is the mechanism? We have different, several mechanisms. One important thing is decreased intake of, uh, of iron, so supplementary iron. Second, these patients, the, most of them, they are ischemic cardiomyopathies, and they use proton pump inhibitors that will reduce uh, ferris, uh, ferric to ferrous uh, uh, iron uh, in, the, in the stomach, and this will reduce uh, uh, ferrous to go into, through the ferroportin to be absorbed into the blood. And third thing is intestinal edema. Intestinal edema will decrease iron uh, absorption through the intestine, 
And fourth thing, because a uh, heart failure is an inflammatory state, there will be increased by the liver of hepcidin, and hepcidin will block uh, ferroportin, which are the transporters for iron in the intestine, and this will lead to decreased iron absorption, in addition to hemodilution because of uh, volume overload and edema. All this will lead to either uh, a true iron deficiency or a relative iron uh, deficiency. And what is the definition of iron deficiency in heart failure? It's we have to measure ferritin and transferritin saturation. So a ferritin less than 100 per se, the patient is iron deficient, or a ferritin between 100 and 300 with a transferritin saturation less than 20%, this means the patient is iron deficient. And how do we calculate transferritin saturation? It's iron over total iron binding capacity. There were several publications in uh, iron deficiency and in iron deficiency anemia and heart failure. I will try to summarize them. The first one was the FAIR HF trial, included patients with NIA class 2 and 3 with the definition of iron deficiency, and they measured a NIA class, uh, functional class at 24 weeks, and the uh, uh, secondary endpoint was 6 minute walk test. And it showed that primary endpoint improvement of uh, of functional capacity regardless of the presence of anemia and improvement in the secondary endpoint whether uh, the patient global assessment, NIHAC functional class, and uh, six minute walk test. Then came the confirmed HF trial, which confirmed this uh, uh, the fair HF trial with the same uh, inclusion and exclusion criteria, giving IV ferric carboxymal dose one or two, uh, 1,000 to 2,000 milligram over six weeks period uh, and follow up these patients for 52 weeks. And patients with ferric carboxymal dose uh, in red, they have improvement in six minute walk distance compared to the placebo where we have reduction in six walk, minute walk distance. Also secondary endpoints, self-reported patient global assessment, NIA class, six minute walk test and other uh, quality of life assessment, they were all uh, positive in the IV ferric carboxymal dose group compared to placebo group. The secondary endpoint which was important in this study is that first hospitalization due to worsening heart failure. And the group of patients on IV ferric carboxymal dose versus placebo, it showed a significant reduction in hospitalization due to worsening uh, heart failure. This was a secondary endpoint but it was important for later uh, studies. Also, the effect HF trial is a similar trial, uh, studying the peak VO2 uh, max in these patients uh, with the cardiopulmonary exercise testing, and it has showed that patient with uh, IV ferric carboxymal dose has improved uh, PVO2 max compared to placebo where their PVO2 max was reduced to. One question that you may ask is why we not re replenish iron stores with oral iron? Oral iron uh, is difficult to be absorbed in patients with iron deficiency, and I showed you the mechanism before, but they, did, they, they have uh, performed a trial called Iron Out. And in this trial, they gave uh, uh, oral iron polysaccharide, 150 milligram twice daily versus placebo, and they followed up these patients at 80 weeks and 16 weeks and measured six minute walk, cardiopulmonary exercise test and biomarkers. And actually iron, uh, uh, oral iron did not change peak VO2 max in these patients. Not only that, but if we compare it with the fair HF, even ferritin and transferritin saturation actually didn't improve, were equal to placebo compared to fair HF where they normal normalized or near normalized. A firm HF study was the last study on uh, uh, IV iron and iron deficiency in acute heart failure patients. And it showed also uh, the primary endpoint was composite of total heart failure hospitalization and cardiovascular deaths up to 52 weeks with addition to other secondary endpoints. These are the baseline characteristics. I will not go over them, but they are a very sick population. This is the primary endpoint heart failure hospitalization and cardiovascular deaths. It, uh, it showed a, a reduction in the ferric carboxymaltose group, but actually didn't uh, 
the p-value was 0.059. It's similar to the uh, Paragon trial in uh, Secretary of but, but the total heart failure hospitalization was significantly reduced. Mortality was not reduced. And they did, because this was in the COVID uh, era where we have reduction of hospitalization. So they did a COVID-19 sensitivity analysis. And this, they only included patients before the COVID-19. Uh, uh, they analyzed the patient before uh, the COVID-19 has started. And actually, it turned out to be positive uh, for the primary endpoint as well as secondary endpoint except cardiovascular death. It is safe to be given in hospital, it's, uh, in hospital and it improved also the quality of life of these patients. And it was in the ESC 2021 guidelines uh, recommended first to measure uh, as a class one to measure IV iron and as a class 2A to give uh, intravenous ferric carboxymal dose for these uh, patients and even to give IV ferric carboxymal dose to these patients in hospital because of the firm trial. There are many proposed a treatment algorithm, but one important thing we have to screen for these patients at least once or twice per year. And there are some protocols to give uh, IV, uh, to, to, to give IV ferric carboxymal dose yeah. in these patients, depending on the hemoglobin level and body weight. There were ongoing trials with half path because we don't have still trials in patients with half path. We're knowing that the firm trial in acute heart failure was patients with an EF less than 50%. And my take home message is iron deficiency can occur without anemia. Iron deficiency in heart failure has prognostic significance without anemia presence. IV iron with ferric carboxymal dose is effective in improving quality of life and reducing hospitalization in a chronic and acute setting. And one important thing, oral iron in half ref patients is not effective in most conditions. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ali, very much. Uh, just a, uh, one question is for me. Uh, we, uh, intravenous iron uh, should be given if the transferatin less than uh, 20, transferatin saturation less than 20. Yes? Uh, uh, by definition, uh, 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 iron deficiency is... Uh, iron deficiency, yes. Yes. Oh. Ferritin less than 100 is enough to, the, to define iron deficiency, or a ferritin between 100 and 300 with a transferritin saturation less than 20%. Yes, this is less than 20. Uh, what is the level uh, you can uh, approach with respect to this trans, uh, saturation? Uh, I think uh, with respect to uh, iron metabolism, there is what is called lapile serum iron. Lapile serum iron. So serum for, iron. For, for at which level I will stop? Uh, to stop giving? No, so uh, the, uh, with respect to uh, saturation, transferatin saturation. saturation percent. Yes. Less than 20, I should give IV iron. Yes, above, above 20, there is no need if ferritin is above 100. Yeah, uh, if the patient more than 20, no IV iron? Uh, if, if the patient has a yeah. transfer in saturation more than 20, if you I, mean? Less than 20, I will give. Yes. If uh, more than 20, I stop? Uh, if ferritin is less than 100, you can give. Hmm. If ferritin is less than 100, you can give. Thank you. One important uh, thing is uh, hemoglobin level should be less than 15. Above 15, there is no studies. It was indexed exclusion criteria so it should be between 8 and uh, it, it should be between 8 and 15 but one important thing if the patients are anemic we have to rule out other causes of anemia before we are we give iron to another uh, simple question uh, if the patient have a severe or uh, uh, near class uh, 4 uh, and they have iron deficiency i can give him uh, yeah. iron Yes, thank you. Give. Thank the you, only Professor thing Rand. you cannot give uh, in patient with fever and in uh, admitted with fever and infection because you have to rule out any side effects from IV iron. So I try to have uh, 
uh, the patient uh, treated from with antibiotics, etc., uh, cleared from infectious point of view, and then you can give IV iron. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And we, uh, for the sake of the time, we will uh, uh, jump to the next speaker, uh, Professor Amina from uh, Kazakhstan. A uh, very uh, uh, tough topic, uh, management of heart failure during the pregnancy. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here once again on this stage. And um, that's, um, yeah, that's a very complicated topic, but it's also a very important topic because uh, the pregnancy is um, um, one of the challenges, once again, and really like challenge topics So during this conference. So, um, and well, why we do have to talk about heart failure in pregnancy because Despite it's being rare in pregnancy, it's still a leading cause of maternal mortality. That is one problem. The second problem is that morbidity risk to mother and fetus is very important to be established. So also advancing early diagnosis um, and definitive treatment of congenital heart disease. And women currently uh, having children later in life, and therefore they may have acquired heart disease. And also it's very important, not only just like to be mentioned, but it's uh, absolutely true that health disparities across the world. So that is very important papers that I would just like you to mention about. And actually why I'm also like a, in, a, in a red square, it's because these two important people that actually made so much effort in a, uh, in a heart failure in, in, in pregnancy, it's a current Sliva and Johan Barsaks, and I'm very happy that I, this year I joined them in a peripartum cardiomyopathy committee. Uh, and this is also very important because once again, the Johan Barsaks was one of the uh, leaders of uh, um, guidelines on a uh, cardiovascular disease during pregnancy. And uh, also another one, uh, practical guidance about a peripartum cardiomyopathy. So um, what we have to know, it's uh, that why it's uh, very challenging, because we do see their hemodynamic changes in pregnancy. I mean, in normal stage, it's uh, like a physical. First, we understand that the pregnancy is a very high output cardiovascular state and actually associated with several hemodynamic changes, including decreased systemic vascular resistance and blood pressure, uh, expanded blood volume, increased heart rate, and cardiac output, but also uh, it's increased in a mean, um, so it's in, uh, reduced in a mean arterial pressure and um, in, uh, increased in a stroke volume. These challenges uh, allow for optimal growth and development of the fetus and protect mother from risk of delivery, but that is for physical, that's a normal um, and physiology. That's very difficult that if um, our women have, um, um, heart failure, per se. So another very important thing is about our changes in blood volume and coagulation cascade. One of the things that we all, well, we, um, most of our pregnant women will have anemia, and this anemia will be relative anemia because the plasma volume will be expanded. And the, uh, the red cells, I mean, compared to red cells, that's why we will have, uh, we will see the relative anemia. Another important moment is that a total intravascular volu volume will increase by about 50% above non-pregnant values. What about coagulation? So coagulations, we have to remember that the resistance to activate protein C decrease free protein S, uh, uh, protein C, increase in factors one, two, four, uh, five, seven, eight, 10, uh, 12, and also activity of the fibrinolytic, uh, fibrinolytic inhibit inhibitors um, PI1 and PI2 increases. So this, uh, this changes leads to a hypercoagulable state in, um, um, in a pregnant woman. So we do know that this uh, causes, uh, I mean, there are major potential causes for maternal heart failure, and so it's uh, including cardiomyopathy, ischemic heart disease, pulmonary hypertension, valvular heart disease, congenital heart disease in, uh, in the adult, and arrhythmias. But what we should do when we understand that our patients, and she's willing to have uh, a, a, a child, we, this patient uh, will, is having one of these causes. So first is very important. We do need 
patients with chronic heart failure or at risk of heart failure during pregnancy to uh, make a counseling before pregnancy. What does it mean? It means that all women with known cardiac disease who wish to become pregnant require this counseling. And that counseling should be given by multidisciplinary management and should be planned, uh, and this plan should be constructed and discussed with the patient. All unhealthy habits such as smoking, alcohol intake, diet, and exercise should be addressed as this directly impact to maternal and fetus outcomes. We do have a risk calculators, and most of the uh, used calculators is modified WHO and CARPAC-2 calculators. What about modified um, WHO ca calculator? It's a for maternal cardiovascular risk. And actually, if you can see here, so the number, so, so the risk is increasing as well as the, uh, as the percentage of uh, maternal, I mean, uh, the risk for maternal death also will be increased. So the first class, it's no detectable increased risk of maternal mortality and no or mild increase in morbidity. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's true that 2.5 to 5% uh, is the risk for ma uh, maternal mortality. So, um, I would like not to stop to all this kind of a risk, but still, the most important that we have to think, it's about WHO risk class three, that it's a significantly increased risk of maternal mortality or severe morbidity. If pregnancy is decided upon, so the intensive monitor should be done. And actually, the, uh, the risk class four, that's very, it's extremely high risk for maternal mortality, and pregnancy should be terminated. It's a uh, very important uh, message that we have to remember and keep in mind. But we don't have only thing, I forget, we, we shouldn't forget about fetal and also the fetal risks. So for example, maternal, our mother has a heart failure or heart disease. And also including like of these risk factors like a cardiomyopathy, hypertension or preeclampsia, multiple gestation, smoking during pregnancy, this all will lead to uh, adverse ne uh, neonatal outcomes such as low birth, infant respiratory distress syndrome, lower Apgar score, premature, and mortality. So there are two kind of risks we have. One is the maternal uh, risk and another is fetal risk. So that is very challenging in this case. And when we are talking about that, and that is very important to know that Yes, of course, we, ident we identify that if the, mm, the mother has a modified WHO for class risk, so the counseling should be against pregnancy. But what about if it's less than fourth class? So it's, of course, we have to early diagnose as, as we can. And then we have to refer our patient to a heart team. And pregnancy heart team, they have to look at hemodynamic optimization before pregnancy. They have to medicate or discontinue um, ter uh, teratogenic drugs when our patient is pregnant. Discuss anticoagulation, survival, surveillance of pregnancy, time and mode of delivery. But that is a plan, like it's a, just like a top of iceberg. But what is under the water? So under the water, it's a very complicated um, flow chart. And this is better to see. So we have to consider termination or delivery if hemodynamic is unstable or our patient is in shock. That's actually uh, uh, according to heart failure treatment and uh, according to heart failure guidelines. We have to think of a percutaneous or surgical in, uh, intervention if appropriate and if it's necessary. Well, if our patient will uh, have a, um, a patient's uh, have arrhythmia, then we need to manage the arrhythmia. Of course, we also do need to stabilize heart failure, and that is like a, a bad rest. We do need to think about optimization of preload as well as afterload, and very important to know that systemic ventricle failure or subpulmonary ventricle failure should be very, very well managed. And Diagnosis and treatment of contributing factors like a pulmonary embolism and arterial hypertension should be also managed. When stabilized, fetus viable and considered delivery of fetus not viable, also uh, we, we have to think of that. And caesarean section will be very much likely in this category of patients. This is also very complicated. I mean, it's, uh, it's very um, 
complicated slide, but I would like not just to mention you that red is bad, green is good. So what kind of medication safety during pregnancy and lactation would you have? So absolutely true that AC inhibitors and ARB are contraindicated in pregnancy. AC, AC inhibitors can be used with a, uh, with a caution uh, in lactation. Loop diuretics, beta blockers can be used also, but um, all of these drugs will have to be used with caution. MRI also not recommended because of a um, because of adverse uh, event, and actually um, can be used in lactation. In lactation, so other diuretics like atiazid diuretics, vasodilators, nitrates can be used. Are any contraindicated not because of uh, um, uh, inhibitor niprilazine, but uh, because of ARB known to be phytotoxic. Glycosate is used extremely caution during pregnancy and lactation. And VKA contraindicated in the first trimester, but can be used during lactation. What kind of a conclusion do I have? In women with known cardiovascular disease, preconception counseling and close follow-up during pregnancy is a very important thing. The management should be according to the underlying cardiac disease and following established guidelines. And that exactly what can be done by multidisciplinary team. And this team should provide thoughtful and complete counseling to the pregnant woman with cardiovascular disease, regardless of the risk and benefit of medication use. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions from the floor? Okay, so Thank I you very go. much. I mean, uh, excellent as usual. Uh, uh, if you have a, a, a female patient who has a history of peripartum cardiomyopathy, ejection fraction did not recover completely, and uh, coming asking for uh, further pregnancy, what's your recommendation? Uh, well, um, it's uh, it's very uh, well. I won't say it's a very challenging question. I would recommend not to, really, because we do, ha we do no know that the recurrence of peripartum cardiomyopathy is very high if a patient already was recovered. So we have to keep in mind that really, uh, uh, so this patient is under risk of the recurrent peripartum cardiomyopathy, and we don't know what a kind of result we will have. There are other options to have a, um, a baby. And I, I'm, I am a kindly uh, apologize, and I know that it's may, maybe not so nice to hear from 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 uh, cardiologists. But in that, for that reason, we do need a multidisciplinary team. We do need a psychologist. We do need uh, obstetrician to explain all their um, explain all risks for mother. And um, the other thing, what is very important, I would like to continue medications in the per, uh, in the patients with recovered. Um, was recovered uh, after recovery after P PPCM because and up to 12 months and then to think once again of these patients but I would not recommend pregnancy so uh, thank you very much I mean and uh, for the sake of time we have to close the session yes but I would just like to say thank you very much for your hospitality for your unique atmosphere I'm very grateful and very pleased to be here with you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Amin. Mean.